Chapter 72 of Varney the Vampire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Shane Nolan. Varney the Vampire, Volume 2, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter 72. The Strange Story, The Arrival of the Mob at the Hall, and Their Dispersion You will find that the time which elapsed since I last saw you in London to have been spent in an eventful very manner. You were in good circumstances then, said Mr. Chillingworth. I was, but many events happened after that which altered the prospect, made it even more gloomy than you can well imagine. But I will tell you all, candidly, and you can keep watch upon Bannerworth Hall at the same time. You are well aware that I was well-to-do, and had ample funds and inclination to spend them. I recollect, but you were married then, surely. I was, said the stranger sadly. I was married then. And now? I am a widower. The stranger seemed much moved, but after a moment or so he resumed. I am a widower now. But how that event came about is partly my purpose to tell you. I had not married long, that is, very long, for I have but one child, and she is not old, or of an age to know much more than what she may be taught. She is still in the course of education. I was early addicted to gamble. The dice had its charms, as all of those who have ever engaged in play but too well know. It is perfectly fascinating. So I have heard, said Mr. Chillingworth, though for myself I found a wife in professional pursuits quite incompatible with any pleasure that took either time or resources. It is so. I would I had never entered one of those houses where men are deprived of their money and their own free will, for at the gambling table you have no liberty, save that in gliding down the stream in company with others. How very few have ever escaped destruction, none. I believe. Men are perfectly fascinated. It is ruin alone that enables a man to see how he has been hurried onwards without thought or reflection, and how fallacious were all the hopes he ever entertained. Yes, ruin and ruin alone can do this. But alas, tis too late. The evil is done. Soon after my marriage I fell in with the Chevalier St. John. He was a man of the world in every sense of the word, and one that was well versed in all the ways of society. I never met with any man who was so perfectly master of himself, and of perfect ease and self-confidence as he was. He was never at a loss, and, come what would, never betrayed surprise or vexation. Two qualities, he thought, never ought to be shown by any man who moved in society. Indeed. He was a strange man, a very strange man. Did he gamble? It is difficult to give you a correct and direct answer. I should say he did, and yet he never lost or won much. But I have often thought he was more connected with those who did than was believed. Was that a fact? inquired Mr. Chillingworth. You shall see as we go on, and be able to judge for yourself. I have thought he was. Well, he first took me to a handsome saloon where gambling was carried on. We had been to the opera. As we came out, he recommended that we should sup at a house where he was well known, and where he was in the habit of spending his evenings after the opera. And before he retired, I agreed to this. I saw no reason why I should not. We went there, and bitterly, have I repented of doing so for years since, and do to this day? Your repentance has been sincere and lasting, said Mr. Chillingworth. The one proves the other. It does. But I thought not so then. The place was glittering and the wine was good. It was a kind of earthly paradise. And when we had taken some wine, the Chevalier said to me, I am desirous of seeing a friend backwards. He is at the hazard table. Uh, will you go with me? I hesitated. I feared to see the place where a vice was carried on. 
I knew myself inclined to prudential motives. I said to him, um, No, St. John, I will wait for you here. It may be as well. The wine is good, and it will content me. Do so, he said, smiling. But remember, I seldom or never play myself, nor is there any reason why you should. I'll go, but I will not play. Certainly not. You are free alike to look on, play, or quit the place at any moment you please, and not be noticed, probably, by a single soul. I arose, and we walked backwards, having called one of the men who were waiting about, but who were watchers and doorkeepers of the hell. We were led along the passage and passed through the pair of doors, which were well secured and rendered the possibility of a surprise almost impossible. After these dark places, we were suddenly let into a place where we were dazzled by the light and brilliancy of the saloon. It was not so large as the one we left, but it was superior to it in all its appointments. At first, I could not well see who was or who was not in the room where we were. As soon, however, as I found the use of my eyes, I noticed many well-dressed men who were busily engaged in play and to took no notice of anyone who entered. We walked about for some minutes without speaking to anyone, but merely looked on. I saw men engaged in play, some with earnestness, others again with great nonchalance, and money changed hands without the least remark. There were but few who spoke, and only those in play. There was a hum of conversation, but you could not distinguish what was said unless you paid some attention to, and was in close vicinity with, the individual who spoke. Well, said St. John, what do you think of this place? Why, I replied, I had no notion of seeing a place fitted up as this. No, isn't it superb? It's beautifully done. They have many visitors, said I. Many more than I could have believed. Yes, they are all bona fide players, men of stamp and rank, men of your seedy legs who have only what they can cheat you out of. Ah, uh, and besides, he added, you may often form friendships here that lead into fortune hereafter. I do not mean in play because there is no necessity for your doing so, or if you do so, in going above a stake which you know won't hurt you. Exactly. Many men can never approach a table like this and sit down to an hour's play, but if they do, they must stake not only more than they can afford, but all their property, leaving themselves beggars. They do, said I. But men who know themselves, their resources, and choose to indulge for a long time, many often come and lay the foundation to a very pretty fortune. Do you see your friend? I inquired. No, I do not, but I will inquire if he has been here. If not, we will go. He left me for a moment or two to make some inquiry, and I stood looking at the table where there were four players, and who seemed to be engaged at a friendly game. And when one party won, they looked grave, and when the other party lost, they smiled and looked happy. I walked away as the Chevalier did not return immediately to me, and then I saw a gentleman rise up from a table. He had evidently lost. I was standing by the seat, unconsciously holding the back of my hand. I sat down without thinking or without speaking and found myself at the hazard table. <clears throat> uh, do you play, sir? Yes, I said. I had hardly uttered the words when I was sorry for them, but I could not recall them. I sat down and play at once commenced. In about ten or fifteen minutes, often losing and then winning, I found myself about a hundred and twenty pounds in pocket. Clear gain by the play. Ah, said the Chevalier, who came up at that moment. I thought you wouldn't play. I, I really don't know how it happened, said I, but I suddenly found myself here without any previous intention. You are not a loser, I hope. Indeed, I am not, I replied but not much a gainer. Nor need you desire to be. Do you desire to give your adversary his revenge now or take another opportunity? At another time, I replied, you will find me here the day after tomorrow when I shall be at your service. Then bowing, he turned away. He is a very rich man whom you have been playing with, said the Chevalier. Indeed. 
Yes. And I have known him to lose for three days together, but you may take his word for any amount. He is a perfect gentleman and a man of honor. Tis well to play with such, I replied. But I suppose you are about to leave. Yes, it grows late, and I have some business to transact tomorrow, so I must leave. I will accompany you part of the way home, said I, and then I shall have finished the night. I did leave with him, and accompanied him home and then walked to my own home. This was my first visit, and I thought a propitious beginning, but it was the more dangerous. Perhaps a loss might have effectually deterred me, but it doubtful to tell how certain events might have been altered. It is just possible that I might have been urged on by my desire to retrieve any loss I might have incurred, and so made myself at once the miserable being it took months to accomplish in bringing me to. I went the day but one after this to meet the same individual at the gaming table, and played some time with varied success, until I left off with a trifling loss upon the night's play, which was nothing of any consequence. Thus matters went on. I sometimes won and sometimes lost until I won a few hundreds, and this determined me to play for higher stakes than any I had yet played for. It was no use going on in the peddling style I had been going on. I had won two hundred and fifty pounds in three months, and had I been less fearful, I might have had twenty-five thousand pounds. Ah, oh, I'll try my fortune at a higher game. Having once made this resolution, I was anxious to begin my new plan, which I hoped would have the effect of placing me far above my then present position in society, which was good, and with a little attention it would have made me an independent man. But then it required patience, and nothing more. However, the other method was so superior, since it might all be done with good luck in a few months. Ah, oh, good luck. How uncertain is good luck. How changeful is fortune. How soon is the best prospect blighted by the frost of adversity. In less than a month I had lost more than I could pay, and then I gambled on for a living. My wife had but one child, her first and only one an infant at her breast. But there was a change came over her, for one had come over me, a fearful one it was too, one not only in manner, but in fortune too. She would beg me to come home early, to attend other matters, and leave the dreadful life I was then leading. Lizzie, said I, we are ruined. Ruined? she exclaimed, and staggered back until she fell into a seat. Ruined? I ruined. It is a short word, but expressive. No, no, we are not ruined. I know what you mean. You would say we cannot live as we have lived. We must retrench, and so we will, right willingly. You much retrench most wonderfully, I said with desperate calmness, for the murder must out. And so we will, but you will be with us. You will not go out night after night, ruining your health, our happiness, and destroying both peace and prospects. No, no, Lizzie. We have no chance of recovering ourselves, house and home, all gone, all, all. My God, she exclaimed. I rail on, said I. You have cause enough, but no matter. We have lost all. How? How? It is useless to ask how I have done, and there is an end of the matter. You shall know more another day. We must leave this house for a lodging. It matters little, she said. All may be won again. If you will but say you will quit the society of those who have ruined you. No one, said I, has ruined me. I did it. It was no fault of anyone else's. I have not that excuse. I'm sure you can recover. I may. Some day fortune will shower her favors upon me, and I live on in that expectation. You cannot mean that you will chance the gaming table, for I am sure you must have lost all there. I have. God help me, she said. You have done your child wrong. 
but you may repair it yet. Never. Tis a long day. Let me implore you on my knees to leave this place and adopt some other mode of life. We can be careful. A little will do, and we shall in time be equal to and better than what we have been. We never can save by chance, and by chance we never shall, she replied. If you will exert yourself, we may yet retrieve ourselves. And exert myself, I will, and quit the gaming table. Ask me to make no promises, said I. I may not be able to keep them. Therefore, ask me to make none. I do ask you, beg of, entreat of you to promise, and solemnly promise me that you will leave that fearful place where men not only lose all their goods, but the feelings of nature also. Say no more, Lizzie. If I can get a living elsewhere, I will, but if not, I must get it there. She seemed to be cast down at this, and she shed tears. I left the room, and again went into the gambling house, and there, that night, I won a few pounds, which enabled me to take my wife and child away from the house they had so long lived in, and took them afterwards to a miserable place. One room where, indeed, there were a few articles of furniture that I'd saved from the general wreck of my property. She took things much less to heart than I could have anticipated. She seemed cheerful and happy. She endeavored to make my home as comfortable as she could. Her whole endeavor was to make me as much as possible forget the past. She wanted as much as possible to wean me away from my gambling pursuits. But that was impossible. I had no hope no other prospect. Thus she strove, but I could see each day she was getting paler and more pale, her figure more round, was more thin, and betrayed signs of emaciation. This preyed upon me, and when fortune denied me the means of carrying home that which she so much wanted, I could never return for two days at a time. Then I would find her shedding tears and sighing. What could I say? If I had anything to take her, then I used to endeavor to make her forget that I had been away. Ah, oh, she would exclaim, you will find me dead one of these days. What do you do now for one or two days? You will do by and by for many days, perhaps weeks. Do not anticipate evil. I cannot do otherwise. Were you in any other kind of employment but that of gambling, she said. I should have some hope of you, but as it is, there is none. Speak not of it. My chances may turn out favorable yet, and you may again be as you were. Never. But fortune is, is inconsistent, and may change in my favor as much as she has done in others. Fortune is indeed consistent, but misfortune is an inconsistent. You are prophetic of evil. Ah, oh, I would to heaven I could predict good. But who ever yet heard of a ruined gambler being able to retrieve himself by the same means that he was ruined? Thus we used to converse, but our conversation was usually of little comfort to either of us, for we could give neither any comfort to the other, and as that was usually the case, our interviews became less frequent and of less duration. My answer was always the same. I have no other chance. My prospects are limited to that one place. Deprive me of that, and I never more should be able to bring you a mouthful of bread. Day after day, day after day, the same result followed. And I was as far from success as I ever was and ever should be. I was yet a beggar. The time flew by. My little girl was nearly four years old, but she knew not the misery her father and mother had to endure. The poor little thing sometimes went without more than a meal a day, and while I was thus upon the town, upon the chances of the gaming table, many a pang did she cause me, and so did her mother. My constant consolation was this. It is bad luck now, I would say, but it will be better by and by. Things cannot always continue thus. It is all for them, all for them.
I thought that by continuing constantly in one course, I must be at land at the ebb of the tide. It cannot always flow one way, I thought. I had often heard people say that if you could have but the resolution to play on, you must in the end seize the turn of fortune. If I could but once do that, I would never enter a hell again as long as I drew breath. This was a resolve I could not only make but keep, because I had suffered so much that I would never run through the same misery again that I had already gone through. However, fortune never seemed inclined to take the turn I had hoped for. Fortune was as far off as ever, and had in no case given me any opportunity of recovering myself. A few pounds were the utmost I could at any time muster, and I had to keep up something of an appearance, and seem as if I had a thousand a year, when God knows I could not have mustered a thousandth of a part of that sum, were all done and paid for. Day after day passed on, and yet no change. I had almost given myself up to despair. When one night, when I went home, I saw my wife was more than usually melancholy and sad, and perhaps ill. I didn't look at her. I seldom did, because her looks were always a reproach to me. I could not help feeling them so. Well, said I, I have come home to you because I have something to bring you. Not what I ought, but what I can. You must be satisfied. I am, said she. I know also you want it. How is the child? Is she quite well? Yes, quite. Where is she? I inquired, looking around the room. But I didn't see her. She used to be up. She has gone to bed, she said. It is very early, yes, but she cried so for food that I was obliged to get her to sleep to forget her hunger. Poor thing. She has wanted bread very badly. Poor thing, I said. Let her be awakened and partake of what I have brought home. With that, my wife waked her up, and the moment she opened her eyes, she again began to cry for food, which I immediately gave her and saw her devour with the utmost haste and hunger. The sight smote my heart and my wife sat by watching and endeavoring to prevent her from eating so fast. This is bad, I said. Yes, but I hope it may be the worst, she replied in a deep and hollow voice. Lizzie, I exclaimed, what is the matter? Are you ill? Yes, very ill. What is the matter with you? For God's sake, tell me, I said, for I was alarmed. I'm very ill, she said. Very ill indeed. I feel my strength decreasing every day. I must drink. You too want food? I have and perhaps do, though the desire to eat seems almost to have left me. For heaven's sake, eat, said I. I will bring you home something more by tomorrow. Eat and drink, Lizzie. I have suffered, but for you and your child's sake, I will do my best. Your best, she said, will kill us both. But alas, there is no other aid at hand. You may one day, however, come here too late to find us living. Say no more, Lizzie. You know not my feelings when you speak thus. Alas, I have no hope, no aid, no friend. No, she replied. Your love of gaming drove them from you, because they would not aid a gambler. Say no more, Lizzie, I said. If there be not an end to this life soon, there will be an end to me. In two days more, I shall return to you. Goodbye. God bless you. Keep up your heart and the child. Goodbye, she said sorrowfully. She shed tears and wrung her hands bitterly. I hastened away. My heart was ready to burst, and I could not speak. I walked about to recover my serenity, but could not do so sufficiently well to secure anything like an appearance that would render me fit to go to the gaming house. That night I remained away, but I could not avoid falling into such a debauch to drown my misfortune and shift the scene of misery that was continually before my eyes. The next night I was at the gaming house. 
I went there in better than usual spirits. I saw, I thought, a change in fortune, and held that as the propitious moment of my life, when I was to rise above my present misfortunes. I played and won, played and lost, played and won, and then lost again. Thus I went on, fluctuating more and more, until I found I was getting money in my pocket. I had at one moment more than three hundred pounds in my pocket, and I felt that then was my happy moment. Then the tide of fortune was going in my favor. I ought to have left off with that, to have been satisfied with such an amount of money, but the demon of avarice seemed to have possessed me, and I went on and on with fluctuating fortune until I lost the whole of it. I was mad, desperate, and could have destroyed myself, but I thought the state of my wife and my child were in. I thought that that night they would want food, but they could not hurt for one day. They must have some or would procure some. I was too far gone to be able to go to them, even if I were possessed of means, but I had none, and daylight saw me in a deep sleep from which I awoke not until the next evening set in and then I once more determined that I would make a desperate attempt to get a little money. I had always paid, and thought my word would be taken for once, and if I won, all well and good, if not, then I was no worse off than before. This was easy to plan, but not to execute. I went there, but there were none present in whom I had sufficient interest to dare make the attempt. I walked about, and felt in a most uncomfortable state. I feared I should not succeed at all. Then what was to become of me, my wife, and child? This rendered me almost mad. I could not understand what I was to do, what to attempt, or where to go. One or two persons came up and asked me if I were ill. My answers were that I was well enough. Good God, how far from the truth that was! but I found I must place more control on my feelings, else I should cause much conversation, and then I should lose all hope of recovering myself, and all prospect of living, even. At length, someone did come in, and I remarked I had been there all evening, and had not played. I had an invitation to play with him, which ended by a little sleight of hand in my favor, and on that I had calculated as much as on any good fortune I might meet. The person I played with observed it not, and, when we left off playing, I had some six or seven pounds in pocket. This, to me, was a very great sum, and the moment I could decently withdraw myself, I ran off home. I was fearful of the scene that awaited me. I expected something worse than I had seen yet. Possibly Lizzie might be angry and scold as well as complain. Therefore I tapped at the door gently but heard no one answer. But of this I took no notice, as I believed that they might be and were most probably fast asleep. I had provided myself with a light, and I therefore opened the door, which was not fastened. Lizzie, said I, Lizzie. There was no answer given, and I paused. Everything was as still as death. I looked on the bed. There lay my wife with her clothes on. Lizzie, Lizzie, said I, but still she did not answer me. Well, said I, she sleeps sound, and I walked toward the bed and placed my hand upon her shoulder and began to shake her, saying as I did so, Lizzie, Lizzie, I come home, but still no answer or signs of awaking. I went on the other side of the bed to look at her face and some misgiving overtook me. I trembled much. She lay on the bed with her back towards the spot where I stood. I came toward her face. My hand shook violently as I endeavored to look at her. She had had her eyes wide open as if staring at me. Lizzie, said I. No answer was returned. I then placed my hand upon her cheek. It was enough and I started back in great horror. She was dead. This was horror itself. I staggered back and fell into a chair. The light I placed down, heaven knows how or why, but there I sat staring at the corpse of my unfortunate wife. 
I can hardly tell you the tremendous effect this had upon me. I could not move. I was fascinated to the spot. I could not move and could not turn. It was morning, and the rays of the sun illuminated the apartment. But there sat I, still gazing upon the face of my unfortunate wife. I saw, I knew she was dead, but yet I had not spoken but sat looking at her. I believe my heart was as cold as she was, but extreme horror and dread had dried up all the warm blood in my body, and I hardly think there was a pulsation left. The thoughts of my child never once seemed to cross my mind. I had, however, sat there long, some hours before I was discovered, and this was by the landlady. I had left the door open behind me, and she, in passing down, had the curiosity to peep, and saw me sitting in what she thought to be a very strange attitude, and could hear no sounds. After some time she discovered my wife was dead, and, for some time, she thought me so too. However, she was convinced to the contrary, and then began to call for assistance. This awoke the child, which was nearly famished. The landlady, to become useful and to awaken me from my lethargy, placed the child in my hands, telling me I was the best person now to take care of it. And so I was. There was no doubt of the truth of that, and I was compelled to acknowledge it. I felt much pride and pleasure in my daughter, and determined she would, if I starved, have the benefit of all I could do for her in the way of care. The funeral over, I took my child and carried it to a school where I left her, and paid in advance, promising to do so as often as the quarter came round. My wife I had seen buried by the hands of man, and swore I would do the best for my child, and to keep this oath was a work of pleasure. I determined also I would never more enter a gambling house. Be the extremity what it might, I would suffer even death before I would permit myself to enter the house in which it took place. I will, I thought, obtain some employment of some kind or other, I could surely obtain that. I have only to ask, and I have it, surely. Something, however menial, that would keep me and my child. Yes, yes, she ought. She must have her charges paid at once. The effect of my wife's death was a very great shock to me, and such a one I could not forget, one I shall ever remember, and one that at least made a lasting impression upon me. Strange, but true, I never entered a gambling house. It was my horror and my aversion, and yet I could obtain no employment. I took my daughter and placed her at a boarding school, and tried hard to obtain bread by labor, but do what I would. None could be had if my soul depended upon it. I could find none. I cared not what it was, anything that was honest. I was reduced low very low. Gaunt starvation showed itself in my cheeks, but I wandered about to find employment. None could be found, and the world seemed to have conspired together to throw me back to the gaming table. But this I would not. At last employment was offered, but what was it? The situation of common hangman was offered to me. The employment was disgusting and horrible. But at the same time, it was all I could get, and that was a sufficient inducement for me to accept it. I was, therefore, the common executioner, and in that employment for some time earned a living. It was terrible, but necessity compelled me to accept the only thing I could obtain. You now know the reason why I became what I have told you. End of chapter 72. Recording by Shane Nolan.